All right. Thank you very much for this opportunity to come here and tell you about what we've been up to. Uh, we do molecular dynamics. That's a movie of hydrogen jiggling around inside of a moth. I'll tell you more about what this stuff is. So the work is a collaboration. Um, we're, if this is a PRAC grant to use blue waters. Um, I and my two of my postdocs are at Yale. We have collaborators at UIUC in computer science, uh, Sanjay Kala's group, and also collaborators at IBM. And uh, the software we're using is this open atom, which I'll tell you more about. Um, if you're interested in using it, feel free. Okay, so uh, this is the overview of the talk, it has three parts. Uh, what is it we're planning to do, and what is a MOF or a metal organic framework, and what's the software we use, and uh, what we've learned to date. So we're almost completing our first year of our PREC, just to give you an idea of where we are. Okay, first thing. Okay, so um, hydrogen, that's H2. Um, you can imagine using it as a fuel, and you can use it as a fuel. It's very energy dense, uh, in the sense that each bond has a lot of energy, and it burns into water, so it's ultra clean and green. It's just hard to store it. <laughs> um, so there's many ways that you can think of store it. It'd be nice to have a lightweight material that can store it. So this is from the DOE. As you can know, they're interested in energy and hydrogen. There's physical methods of storing it, like how to put it in a canister and squeeze it and whatever. Then there's material-based solutions, which is a material, imagine some kind of a generalized sponge. It sucks in the hydrogen, and then when you heat it or you change the pressure, it releases it, right? So what is this, what is this material sponge? And there's a lot of possibilities. People have been working on and proposing. One class are called metal organic frameworks. So metal organic frameworks, I'll show you an image showing what it looks like. They're basically porous materials, lots of holes in them, large interior surface areas, and the hydrogen can stick in there. They're very complex materials, so the details of this binding of the hydrogen is not really understood, and the optimization of the material to make more hydrogen storage, therefore, is difficult because it's become highly empirical. Try, 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 see what happens. So um, here's a typical MOF structure. The yellow thing is in material. It's highlighting the void in the material for you. So there are these corner motifs connected by these bridging motifs. And this thing is a crystal, so it repeats in all the directions. Um, zooming in on one of these motifs, uh, this is one very classical MOF, it's called MOF 5. This is basically a benzene ring, that's the linker, connecting the two corners. The two corners have zinc atoms coordinated by oxygen. Choosing zinc versus some other atom changes the binding properties of the material. And you can fabricate within a ra reasonable range many, many variants. Okay, we're studying this thing called MOF-5, which has this wonderful chemical name. Um, simulation cell, which is the smallest you can reasonably describe it, has 424 atoms in it, and uh, you can change the zinc to other materials. Okay, so questions. How do the H2 bind and then diffuse inside? Uh, what's the temperature and loading dependence? These are very practical questions we'd like to know. Um, so you have to do some kind of dynamics, right? Like the atoms have to move around and you have to see how they move around and where they stick and how long. That's called molecular dynamics. You simulate the motion of the MOF atoms and the hydrogen atoms and you just follow them in real time. And this allows you to understand both dynamics and thermodynamics, which is you need to understand both. Okay, so the technical challenge and the reason we have a PRAC is the following. Hydrogen is very light. In fact, it's the lightest molecule that we have. Um, in a standard molecular dynamics calculation, each atom's coordinate is represented by three X, Y, Z coordinates, and then the atoms have forces on each other and you kind of track that around, right? Uh, the problem is hydrogen is so light that it's basically quantum mechanical at any ambient temperature. That means that it, you shouldn't describe it as a point moving around, but as wavy, which actually makes the problem harder. And the question is, does it matter? And I'll address that in a simple slide later but it actually does matter. So that's a technical challenge. Okay, so what's the software we're using? Um, and you know, what does it do and all of that? And I'll talk about the hydrogen as part of the software. Okay, so this software is a collaborative project um, bringing together Yale, UIUC, and IBM. Um, the initial versions of the software were developed by these two members of our team uh, doing the molecular dynamics. I've joined a team in the last iteration as part of an SS SI2 SSI grant, and Dan Katz was our program manager. <laughs> and um, so we both work on the ground state, that's the molecular dynamics, and also electron excitations, which is not the subject of this talk, but that's the thing we're adding to the software. 
All right. And we're using this Charm++ parallel infrastructure, or if you like, a runtime library that we heard in the invited talk that has been developed primarily at UIUC and then applied to OpenAtom. Okay, what does this software do? It's a massively parallel ab initio molecular dynamics, AIMD. What does this mean? Um, you describe the electrons that glue matter together, uh, forming the bonds explicitly. So you have to solve basic equations of physics, like quantum mechanics, Schrodinger's equation, and how charges repel and attract each other. So um, why you want to do this is because if you're trying to understand something in material and no one knows the details, then you have to start from first principles, so really there's no other way. Later, you can maybe have fudge parameters to kind of fit the data, but if you don't have the data, you have no reliability, you have to do it from first principles. So um, we do it in the most general way possible. It's basically we use a Fourier basis to represent the electrons, so it's completely general. We can handle localized electrons and delocalized electrons and halfway in between. Um, if, you're interest, if you do FFTs for a living, we've developed a special parallel FFT library, which is a very good performance. It's just you can download it for free. Um, for the experts in the room, we use plane waves, that means Fourier, and pseudopotentials. And this method can do all kinds of different kinds of, this software does Carr Paranello, if you know what that means, if you don't forget it, or Born Oppenheimer. It does different kinds of dynamics. Okay, so um, I'll show you a little bit about how the method scales. So what we do is we pick them off, and the problem size is fixed, and we just increase the number of processors and see what happens. So this is, uh, it says Cray XC6, but this is Blue Waters. So um, this is a log-log scale, the number of uh, cores used and the time to solution for one step of the molecular dynamics. The red is you just take the software from the web, download it, compile and run. And then if you talk to your UIUC people, they say, oh, well, Blue Waters actually has a special topology. Why don't you use this configuration file? So you, for free, you can drop by 30%. But basically, for this problem size, we're scaling very well up to tens of thousands of cores. So this is strong scaling. Um, so we're pleased with that. Of course, if our problem was larger, we'd get better scaling. Um, so it's one thing to scale a code. It's the other thing is, are you wasting your time, although you scale well? But that's, that question cannot be answered without comparing to something else. So another competitor code, is, which is an older code, so it's been around longer, uh, is this uh, Qbox, which has turned into Qball at La Los Alamos National Lab. So here we ran some water molecules um, on their blue gene Q and sorry, on the blue gene queue at Argonne. And this is, again, a log-log scale of scaling. This is the open atom, this is the cue ball. Factors of two or three difference should not be taken very seriously because these depend a lot on twiddling the knobs in each software. Rather, the point of this plot is that we have really good scaling of the software and it's highly competitive with what's available there. So it scales well and the time to solution is good and also the time to solution is is good in the sense of, you know, like you should run this software instead of the other one or at least you're gonna do at least as well. So we're pleased about that as well. So this is the kind of software that we're running. So um, let me tell you a little about this hydrogen, the technical challenge. So I've zoomed in on part of the MOF here. This is that benzene ring and benzene has carbons and hydrogens and there's a hydrogen sticking out bonded to a carbon. Um, and you know, when you do your classical simulation, everything's vibrating. And you can go look up the vibrational frequency of this bond or go measure it. And it's 9 times 10 to 13 hertz, which is high for vibrational frequencies. That's because hydrogen is light, right? If you have a spring and a mass and the mass is light, right, the frequency is very high. Okay, so that's how it vibrates. And if we look at our simulation, if you look carefully, you'd see that hydrogen jiggling in that movie. Okay, um, so in the classical point light picture, this bond length vibrates. And you can have a lots of vibration or a small amount of vibration. It's a continuous amount of energy. More importantly, like as the rest of the system transfers energy in and out of that bond, the amplitude of its vibration changes. And if your other hydrogens are around, they can either get jostled by that, and that'll change how they diffuse. The question is, does this have any resemblance to reality? OK, so in quantum systems, which is the, how the universe actually operates, energy is discrete. I'm sure you've heard that. Uh, you've seen this energy relation from Einstein, E equals HF or H nu, maybe you were brought up. <laughs> that says that if you know the frequency, then the energy is quantized in units of H times nu. So because we also have something called Boltzmann's constant, we can change energy into temperature. So the, the temperature you get when you convert this number using that and Boltzmann constant is 4,300 Kelvin. So what is the meaning of this? That means that 
if you want to excite this vibrating degree of freedom, which is quantum mechanical, appreciably above its lowest energy state, you have to be at 4,300 Kelvin. That's very, very hot. I mean, anything, almost anything reasonable either melts or vaporizes. So since we're running around 300 Kelvin, approximately, um, what this means is that this bond is actually not vibrating at all under any ambient conditions. It's sort of frozen because quantum mechanically it's in its ground state. Okay, so there's a giant qualitative error in the simulation where you ask it to jiggle. That's a separate question of does it matter, right, which is what we're trying to answer. But that's why you have to kind of include it because otherwise it's totally uncontrolled what you're doing, I would say, if you're interested in the dynamics. If you're only interested in the statics and the thermodynamics, then it's possible that your quantum and classical simulation have the same equilibrium bond length. It's just one case it vibrates and the other case doesn't do anything. But in terms of the dynamics, that so this other hydrogen molecules are moving around, what happens to them, that's one of the questions we are trying to answer in this PRAC, and more generally, like what happens when you change the transition metals and stuff. So this is our technical challenge. This is just one slide to give you a flavor. Like things that are moving shouldn't be moving, and we gotta get that right. Okay, so how do we actually do the simulation? Um, doing quantum mechanical nuclei is a very, very hard problem, as chemists will tell you. But if we're interested in kind of statistical averages, it's a little bit easier, there's a method called Monte Carlo. Basically, uh, imagine that um, each of uh, these beads kind of represents an atom or a configuration of atoms. Um, normally, your atoms are bonded together by springs, imagine, or potentials. And in this method, to include the nuclear behavior, you add an additional string in a different axial direction. Uh, the, the, the strengths of these springs are determined by a formula that reproduces the quantum mechanical properties. And then you string it all up into one giant molecular dynamic simulation where your atoms talk to each other regard their, through their regular potential, whatever it was, uh, that we calculate quantum mechanically. And then they talk to the replicas. These are basically replicas via these special artificial springs. So what it allows you to do is this wonderful thing in statistical physics, quantum statistical physics, is that if you're willing to make replicas of your system along a new axis, you can describe quantum mechanical statistics with a large set of coupled classical simulations. Okay, it's an interesting result. If you heard the word Trotter Suzuki, maybe that brings back some memories from grad school or something for you. Okay, so we basically can describe the quantum statistics classically. The price we pay is we have to replicate our system n times, string them together with some springs, and simulate the whole thing jiggling around. And then, of course, the number of these replicas you have should go to infinity in principle, and the springs should become weak, and there's some formulas for that, but usually you can get away with 16, 32, or 64 replicas, depending on the temperature you're interested in. So that's the method that we use. So in addition to just having a big simulation with lots of atoms moving around, we have to have replicas of them that are moving around and talking to each other. So this has been developed and tested. Um, the results I'm showing you are not on Blue Waters, but on Mira, but I believe it's quite similar. So we took them off and we had eight replicas or 16 replicas or 32 replicas all talking to each other. It's this mega dynamical simulation. And again, it's a scaling uh, result with a number of cores. Overall, we're pleased. There's some room for tweaking, but overall we're pleased. Things go down, they go down more or less the same way. Our criticism of our own work is that if we had ideal scaling, uh, every time you double the core count and double the number of images, it should have been flat, right? Do you see it goes up a little bit? Like if I had twice as many images but twice as many processors, I should have just run exactly at the same speed, but it's not exactly scaling perfectly, but it's pretty good. So we're working on you know, getting this better but it's, it's not a huge penalty to pay. So this is basically how things are running. The thing seems to scale pretty well. Um, and this is why we need blue, blue waters, because just to run one of these classical simulation takes to get a very small amount of data, which is the preliminary results I will show you, it takes about four, five, six days of 1,000 nodes running full tilt, okay? And then we want to do 64 copies of it for 10 times longer. So we need a very fast parallel computer and large amounts of resources. Okay, so what have we learned so far? I can show you preliminary results for what we've learned. We have not unleashed a full quantum calculation. We've done basically benchmarking of the classical calculation, which is the baseline to compare to for the quantum corrections. 
So I showed you this movie. So what, this is the movie that uh, I showed you. So let's look at it a little more carefully. These are the zinc containing corners. The red things are oxygen. These are the little benzene kind of linkers here. You see that they have interesting kind of dynamics themselves. The little friends that are going around like flies, those are hydrogen molecules. This is a classical simulation. So if you look very carefully, for example, you can see these bonds vibrating that shouldn't be vibrating. And you know, so we get some data from this. This is the raw simulation result. It's a long molecular dynamic simulations, depending on your standards. This is about 20 picoseconds, which for some people is long and for some people is really, really short, <laughs> okay? I'll show you some data and we can kind of figure out how many more picoseconds we need to get reasonable data. So one thing you can do is make a heat map. So this is a 2D projection. Uh, the white things are the backbone of the moth. So you can see the voids and you can see where the atoms are. And then the colorful stuff is where does the hydrogen spend time. So it does spend a lot of time in these voids. It doesn't really get that close to the center of these metallic regions, at least in this simulation. Um, and you can see that this pattern isn't exactly symmetric. That's because the simulation isn't long enough. If you just run it longer, then everything will get sampled democratically. Um, here's a different representation. We call it the noodle representation, where we take all the hydrogens and we just trace out their path. So you can sort of see like what they're doing. You know, this is the background of the moth and the hydrogen come over here, they go to the next box, they go here, and then of course the simulation ends, so the noodle is of a finite length. Um, so this is what we would do more in you know, standard classical statistical mechanics. We would uh, take each hydrogen, mark down a starting point, run the simulation, and see how far it wandered from where it started. And we have nice results, again, from Einstein and another seminal work in 1905, which tells you how far it goes as a function of time. In fact, you should compute the square of the displacement versus time linearly, and when it becomes linear, that's called diffusion. And there's some factor of six telling you what the diffusion concept is. So here we have, in this particular simulation, we had six hydrogen molecules. This is a very short simulation. And you can see each one does something funny. And then we average them, it's sort of linear-ish. We need a lot better statistics. This is preliminary data, but you can get it out already that basically something's happening here. Um, you can, just to make sure that you're not off by orders of magnitude, <laughs> you can get the slope of this line and convert it to a diffusion constant. It's around 10 to the minus eight meters per second squared. Um, this more or less agrees ballpark with other numbers in the literature, which are from simulations using classical potentials with no quantum corrections and this and that. This is just to make sure we're not going insane, okay? Uh, we'll need longer simulations with more hydrogens. Um, so that's the summary for you of where we are. So I told you what a MOF is and why we care about a MOF. I told you the software that we use, which is this open atom on blue waters, and the technical challenge is the nuclear quantum effects on the hydrogen, which make for a very large simulation that needs a lot of statistics, and blue waters is sort of an ideal machine for that. I showed you some preliminary non-quantum simulations laying the baseline for us. We need probably another month or two to really finish those up and get very good statistics, and we'll be beginning our large-scale quantum simulations in the coming year. Thank you very much for your time.